But first, let's go straight to news that's breaking this minute. Visuals coming in of an explosion at a residential area in Gaza City. These are the latest visuals that we are getting at this point. Have a look. The Palestinian Health Ministry says three Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in the West Bank. <laughs> Gaza has been cut off from the world again. This is the third time since the war started that communication lines have been cut and we are being told that internet lines are gradually being is restored. Hamas spokesperson Osama Hamdan has given a press conference in Beirut. He claimed the Israeli army is suffering military failures on the field. Hamdan also accused Israel of destroying Gaza's medical sector with the aim of displacing Palestinians from the strip of land. In fact, a spokesman for the Gaza Health Ministry has said that Israel is, quote-unquote, preparing something bad for the Al-Shifa medical complex. One month of the war and the tragedy continues to unfold. Nearly 10,000 people have died so far in Gaza. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza saying over 4,100 children have died in the war so far. Over 2,600 women have lost their lives. 152 people have died in the West Bank, 1,400 in Hamas's attacks on Israel. The United Nations has said that 88 UNRWA staff have died in Gaza. The UN saying this is the highest number of UN fatalities recorded in a single conflict. One month on, civilians continue to suffer. Children have been pushed to the front line. Have a look at this. <laughs> Wounded children are being carried to a hospital in Gaza City. In the Gaza Strip, there is shortage of bread, shortage of water. This is Ankara. Hundreds are protesting against the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to Turkey. Protesters are accusing the United States, in fact, of complicity in the death of the Palestinian civilians in Gaza. <laughs> Anthony Blinken has wrapped up his West Asia tour and before leaving Turkey, he said the U.S. is working very aggressively on getting more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. We know the, the deep concern here for the terrible toll that Gaza is taking on uh, Palestinians, on men, women and children in Gaza, innocent civilians, a concern that we share and that we're working on every single day. This is Paris. This French Spider-Man is ascending the Paris Tower to call for peace in Gaza. And in Tel Aviv, the families of Israeli hostages are calling on the Netanyahu government to secure the release of their loved ones. Listen in. He's a therapist. He's a very kind person. 
we hope that he's helping also the other hostages, maybe the children. Romy is one of the best things in the world. She's my little sister. And we're a total of five siblings. She's the, I'm the first one and she's the third one. And she's like the glue that connects us together. We're asking that the first priority of the government would be to bring those people back. Now, immediately. Every day goes by, you know, we've all been some trauma. And I lost my grandfather. My uncle lost his house and their house. Israel has released this footage. It shows civilians walking towards southern Gaza. An Israeli press release read, and I'm quoting, following the IDF's repeated calls on the residents of Gaza City to evacuate from the area over the last day and in accordance with set hours by the IDF, the IDF has reopened an evacuation corridor to allow civilians in the northern Gaza Strip to move southward for their own safety. Chinese President Xi Jinping's dream project, the Belt and Road Initiative, has suffered yet another blow. The Philippines has decided to exit it. And it is the second country to do that this year, by the way. Before the Philippines, it was Italy, the only G7 member of China's biggest international project. Why are countries pulling out? A decade into the project, can they now see through China's debt trap diplomacy? Is this the beginning of the end of BRI? It is a huge embarrassment for President Xi Jinping you see, BRI is his brainchild. It was supposed to be the highway to Chinese supremacy, but that highway seems to be filled with roadblocks. The Philippines Department of Transportation has announced the full termination of several major infrastructure projects partnered with China, and this includes railway connecting Kalamba to Baikal province. It was worth $2.5 billion. Another one is a 100-kilometer commuter rail line in the southern Philippines. It was worth $1.45 billion. The third and more symbolic was a freight railway connecting uh, the uh, Subic Bay Freeport Zone and Clark Freeport Zone. These are two of the nerve centers of the U.S. military power in the Asia-Pacific. And this one was slated to cost close to $900 million. But it will no longer receive China's money because the Philippines plans to pull out. The Philippine Transportation Secretary claimed that China has lost interest and that the country cannot sit around and wait for funding forever. The interesting part is the Philippine snub comes after a skirmish in the South China Sea. Last month, there were two collisions between Chinese and Philippine vessels in the disputed sea. China's Coast Guard collided with a Philippine resupply boat. And in a separate incident, a Philippine Coast Guard vessel was bumped by a Chinese military vessel. The Philippines, however, saying that it has nothing to do. This has nothing to do with its exit from the BRI. Reports say the Philippines was not satisfied with the progress of the partnered projects. It is seeking investment from Japan and the West. When Italy hinted it was going to pull out, it cited similar concerns. And back in July, Italy's defense minister called the BRI wicked. That is the word that he used. He said the decision to join the project was an improvised act that led to a double negative result. And this is bringing a great deal of embarrassment to China, to say the least. The ambitious infrastructure project just completed 10 years. Only last month, there was a lot of chest thumping. Beijing invited leaders and delegates from over 140 nations to celebrate BRI's decade-long journey. All this for what? The BRI has been failing to deliver what it actually promised. And this has been happening for some time now. Some poor nations stand knee deep in debt. In others, the projects have failed to yield the expected returns. The unkept promises have added up and the results are in front of you. Countries now want to opt out. They want nothing to do with the BRI. And this comes at a time when President Xi Jinping's leadership is under question. When Xi Jinping's unprecedented third term began, he stacked the top leadership with loyalists. 
Xi's hand-picked elite was supposed to pave the path for his grand vision for China. But months on, there is turbulence in China's top ranks. And we still don't know where the ousted defense minister Li Shangfu and foreign minister are. The downfall of Xi's own loyalists is reflecting badly on him. That aside, there are major economic troubles there in the country. It is plagued by a real estate crisis, high unemployment, and dwindling confidence among the investors. And on the world stage, China's competition with the West is only increasing. It seems like Xi Jinping's policies are not working out, neither at home nor outside. And there are questions around his judgment, a dampening international confidence in his governance. Two nations have dumped China's most visionary project, and it is bound to leave President Xi Jinping red-faced. When Hamas operatives attacked Israel, the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was prompt in his condemnation. Trudeau told the world it should, quote-unquote, stand united against acts of terror. And tonight, we are daring Justin Trudeau to practice what he preaches. Stand against terror, Mr. Trudeau, and arrest Gurpatwan Singh Panu. Can you do that? Pick up the phone and give that arrest order? Panu is a Khalistani terrorist. He has threatened Indians, also millions of others, who fly India's flag carrier Air India every year, which, by the way, also includes thousands of Canadians. Panu has threatened to blow up an Air India plane. You heard that right. In a video released over the weekend, Panu said, and I'm quoting, we are asking the Sikh people not to fly via Air India. After November 19, there will be a global blockade. Sikh people don't travel by Air India. After November 19, your life can be in danger. Now, this is not the first time Khalistani terrorists are targeting Air India. Let me just take you back to the year 1985. Air India Flight 182 had taken off from Montreal. It was on its way to London. And from there, it would go to Delhi, followed by Bombay. The plane never reached its destination. Khalistani terrorists planted a bomb on the flight. It exploded when the plane was mid-air, somewhere over the Atlantic. There were 329 people on board, 268 were Canadian citizens, all of them died. The bombing of the Air India Flight 182 is the worst terrorist attack in the history of Canada. Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, was Canada's Prime Minister back then. He was accused of not doing enough to prevent that tragedy. The mastermind of the bombing was a Khalistani terrorist, Talvinder Singh Parmar. One of the accused in this case was a man named Ripudaman Singh Malik. Canada acquitted him for lack of evidence. Malik was one of Panu's closest aides. And Gurpatwan Singh Panu is trying to repeat history. Does Justin Trudeau have what it takes to crack down on this? For once, can Trudeau let the vote bank politics be? Arrest Panu, interrogate him, jail him? Trudeau has everything he needs to act. There is evidence, also a solid, solid case. Panu was born in Amritsar, India. He left the country to stir anti-India sentiments abroad. And today, Panu leads a group called Sikhs for Justice. There is nothing right or just about this group. It is backed by Pakistan and the ISI. India has banned Sikhs for Justice. It is now on the lookout for Panu. In the year 2023 alone, Panu has threatened Hindus in Canada. He has released videos threatening to target Indian missions in Canada. Panu also issued a threat to the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And what has Trudeau done about this terror emanating from his backyard? In one word, nothing. Mr. Trudeau has indulged in selective condemnation of terror. He condemns all terrorism except terrorists who have found a safe haven in Canada, the likes of Panu. In the year 2020, India declared Panu a proclaimed terrorist. 
He currently faces over 20 criminal cases in India. A court in India issued non bailable warrants against him. But this terrorist continues to roam about freely in Trudeau's Canada. He had, although, gone into hiding for a bit earlier this year, after two Khalistani terrorists were killed in Canada within a short span of time. Clearly, Panu has resurfaced now. All eyes are on the 19th of November and Justin Trudeau. Will Trudeau do what he preaches? When he came down to India for the G20 summit, the Canadian Prime Minister said, quote-unquote, we are always there to prevent violence and push back against hatred. On the 10th of October, Trudeau tweeted, glorification of violence is never acceptable in Canada by any group or in any situation. Let me just read that again. Glorification of violence is never acceptable in Canada by any group or in any situation. This is Trudeau's chance to actually walk the talk. Prove to us and the world that he does not speak with a double tongue, that he is more than just hot air. This is Trudeau's chance to not repeat mistakes made during his father's term. Like I was telling you, back in 1984, Canadian authorities were criticized for not doing enough to prevent the attack on the Air India plane. In the year 2006, a public inquiry set up by a Canadian Supreme Court judge concluded that a cascading series of errors led to the largest mass murder in Canadian history. Canada was warned months before the bombing. Weeks before the attack, Canada's secret services followed Khalistani terrorists to some woods on Vancouver Islands. He heard a loud explosion. Canada did nothing and 329 people lost their lives. Justin Trudeau's inaction risks repeating history. So Mr. Trudeau, what is your plan of action? Friendly democracies do not protect terrorists. Friendly democracies do not endanger the lives of innocent people. The world is watching.